Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 81, Space Shuttle Flight 14, STS-51A. Take a commsat, leave a commsat. Last time, we talked about the 13th flight of the Space Shuttle, STS-41G. We saw the deployment of the Earth Radiation Budget Satellite, which worked perfectly after a little RMS wiggling, and the successful use of a radar scanning instrument. What was already a somewhat complex mission suddenly got a lot more complex when the KU band antenna lost its ability to point, requiring the orbiter to point for it, using its attitude control system to rotate the entire vehicle. The mission didn't gather quite as much data as was hoped, but thanks to the ingenuity and elbow grease of engineers both on the ground and on orbit, all experiments were at least a partial success. Once again, having someone up there to bang on the thing proves to be pretty useful. Four times ago, we talked about the 10th flight of the space shuttle, STS-41B. The flight is best known for being the first to demonstrate the use of the Manned Maneuvering Unit, a rocket-powered jetpack that enabled tetherless spacewalks. Less famous but more relevant to this episode is that STS-41B also deployed a couple of commercial communication satellites, Palapa B-2 and Westar-6. The play-by-play -play of what happened next is available in episode 77, but the upshot is that both satellites were left stranded in an orbit that was far lower than intended, and completely useless for their mission. The reason that these poor stranded satellites are relevant to this mission is... we're gonna go get them. Typically when stuff like this happens, and it happens more often than you might think, one of two things takes place. First, the mission operators could buckle in for a lengthy orbit-raising campaign, using tiny station-keeping thrusters to execute dozens of lengthy, but low-thrust, burns until the spacecraft gets to a useful orbit. They sacrifice years of operational time in the future to get there, but at least the mission isn't a complete wash. Second, the mission operators could call their insurance company, cash out, and call it a day. Every once in a while you get something crazy like AsiaSat-3 being sent out around the moon, look it up, but usually those are the two options. In this case, the operators called their insurance company, cashed out, and Lloyds of London suddenly found themselves the owner of two useless satellites. What to do? Well, since this is the early 1980s, what Lloyds of London did was call NASA. A deal was worked out where NASA would rendezvous with the satellites, capture them, load them into the payload bay, and return them to Earth where they could be launched again, this time with a functioning upper stage. It's worth noting that this capability, if it could be successfully demonstrated, would be quite the feather in NASA's cap. Rendezvousing with a satellite was already pretty hard. Grabbing that satellite and working on it was incredible. And bringing the whole thing home was unbelievable. A successful execution of this mission would leave everyone a winner. The original owners got their insurance payout, the insurance company got their satellites back, and NASA would have demonstrated yet another powerful and unique capability that other launch providers simply could not offer. It's worth noting that while NASA PR was talking about this flight like it was just another day in the office, the flight's commander wasn't so sure. According to him, getting one satellite back would be a challenge. Getting two back would be an outright miracle. As I mentioned last time, I'm going to be making an effort to reduce the length of the crew biography portion of the show. What should be a fun little add-on sort of spiraled into a big chunk of the episode once we hit the shuttle era. I want this section to remain interesting, not tedious, so it'll be a little tighter from now on. Let's get into it. Flying STS-51A would be a crew of five, with three mission specialists, no payload specialists, and two rookies. Commanding the flight would be Rick Hawk. We last saw Hawk as the pilot of STS-7. This is his second of three flights. Flying as pilot was Dave Walker. David Walker was born on May 20th, 1944 in Columbia, Georgia. Walker comes to us from the pilot astronaut mold, graduating from the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. From there, he made his way through a variety of operational and test flying roles for the Navy, flying the F-4 Phantom and F-14 Tomcat. Walker was scooped up by NASA in the class of 1978 
and among other support activities, served as a chase pilot for the STS-1 landing. This is his first of four space flights. Mission Specialist 1 was Joe Allen, who we last saw deploying commsats back on STS-5. This is his second and final flight. Mission Specialist 2 was Anna Fisher. Anna Fisher was born on August 24, 1949 in New York City, but grew up in San Pedro, California. Fisher can be counted among that ultimate group of elite overachievers, the physician astronaut, having earned her MD from UCLA in 1971. After spending some time studying subjects as diverse as X-ray crystallography and emergency medicine, she was selected as an astronaut in 1978. Despite this being her only spaceflight, Fisher will remain at NASA longer than the space shuttle will. Other than a six-year hiatus taken for family reasons, she was an active astronaut all the way up until 2014 before finally transitioning into management and then later retiring in 2017. Oh, and for your space trivia, Anna Fisher is the first mother to launch into orbit. Rounding out the crew was Mission Specialist 3, Dale Gardner. We last saw him on STS-8, and this is his second and final flight. The launch was delayed by one day due to upper-level winds. Given all of the things that make a launch dangerous, the risk posed by upper-level winds is easy to underestimate for a spaceflight newbie. I have personally experienced the agony of sitting mere miles away from a rocket on a gorgeous sunny day, only to be told that they can't launch yet due to unacceptable weather. Well, it may be a gorgeous sunny day on the ground, but a few miles up may be a different story. Since a rocket rapidly ascends through various layers of our atmosphere, they rapidly encounter these powerful winds blowing in different directions. These sudden forces can severely stress the structure of the launch vehicle, causing it to bend and flex, and are actually contributing factors to both the Challenger and Columbia accidents. Upper-level winds, in the words of one notable rocketeer, hit like a sledgehammer when going up supersonic. Oh, and don't feel too bad for me. After delaying for a few hours, the upper-level winds cleared away, and I got to watch that notable rocketeer's car be launched into a heliocentric orbit. But that's a story for another day. On November 8th, 1984, the weather on the ground and high above it was clear, and at 7.15 a.m., Discovery lifted off for the second time. Eight and a half minutes of powered flight, and two ohms burns later, the crew found themselves in a 280 by 300 kilometer orbit. The planned satellite retrieval was easily the flashiest part of the mission plan, but it wasn't all STS-51A would do. Just like how you should never make a trip to the moving van empty-handed, it didn't make sense to launch with an empty payload bay. So making the ride uphill in the back of the orbiter would be two different communication satellites. Anik D-2 was the first of these two to be deployed, popping out of the payload bay on flight day two. This communication satellite was geo-bound and was basically a carbon copy of several that we've seen before. Owned by Telesat Canada, Anik D-3 joined the growing Anik fleet to enhance the communications and television ability of wide swaths of rural Canada. We saw a previous generation of Anik spacecraft, Anik C-3, on STS-5, the first shuttle to deploy commercial payloads, and another mission with Joe Allen on board. Since Anik D-2 used the same Hughes spacecraft bus as both satellites the mission was to retrieve, others in the astronaut corps jokingly warned the crew to not accidentally bring this one back home. Another day, another satellite deployment, as Flight Day 3 rolled around. Today's payload was LeaseSat-1, or SYNCOM-4-1. It seems to have two different names. If you have been paying unreasonably close attention, you may recognize this satellite from STS-41D, where it was on the original launch manifest and was on board for the RSLS abort. In the months before the next launch attempt, LeaseSat-1 was removed so that they could replace a UHF relay circuit, and LeaseSat-2 was launched instead. LeaseSat, or SYNCOM, or whatever, was part of a DoD communications network. Since it was designed specifically with the orbiter in mind, it was significantly larger than the Hughes satellites we've seen so often. It was loaded sideways into the payload bay and kicked out using a Frisbee-style deployment. 
both satellites successfully carried out their orbit racing campaigns and were able to slot into their designated box at the geostationary ring. So no retrieval missions for these two. Flight Day 4 was mostly used to give the crew some downtime before the taxing EVAs to come. The cabin pressure was also slightly dropped to ease the transition from the cabin to the lower pressure in the spacesuits. One activity added to this flight was to use the remote manipulator system to keep an eye on the wastewater dumps. No one wanted a repeat of the alarming icicle that had been discovered on STS-41D and suspected on STS-41B. When Flight Day 5 arrived, Discovery was already closing in on the two spacecraft it hoped to retrieve. This process was actually started months earlier, when both target spacecraft were lowered from an orbit around 1,000 kilometers high, down to a nice circular orbit that was only about 350 kilometers high. This lower circular orbit was much more suitable for the difficult task ahead. Since Palapa B-2 trailed West Star 6 by about 1,100 kilometers, Discovery, sneaking up from behind, would reach it first. Under the careful control of Commander Hawk and Pilot Walker, Discovery eased up next to Palapa B-2, stopping with the spacecraft about 10 meters away. Joe Allen and Dale Gardner began to make their way out into the payload bay, while Anna Fisher got on the robot arm controls. Before we talk about what actually happened, let's talk about what was supposed to happen. Palapa B-2 was not designed with servicing in mind. After all, it was headed to an orbit over 40,000 kilometers high, far beyond the shuttle's capability. So the first problem was, just how do you grab hold of the thing? It was a big cylinder with no handholds and covered in delicate solar cells. On top of that, it would be rotating. Only about 1 RPM, but that rotation would have to be stopped before bringing it into the payload bay. Even if the crew wanted to give the T-pad another shot, there were no trunnion pins on Palapa B-2 to grab onto. But what was eventually worked up was a sort of similar concept. Allen, on the MMU, would carry a mechanism known as the Apogee Kick Motor Capture Device. This device was a long spike with some specialized equipment attached to it that was quickly redubbed the Stinger by the crew, since it sort of looks like a bee stinger, I guess. Allen would maneuver himself behind the rotating spacecraft and insert the Stinger into the nozzle of the upper stage engine, the Apogee Kick Motor. Once inserted, the mechanism would expand inside and latch onto the spacecraft, allowing Allen to de-spin it using the MMU and giving the crew a stable structure with which to manipulate the spacecraft. On the side of the Stinger was a grapple fixture for the shuttle RMS, which Fisher would grab, allowing her to move Palapa B-2 and Joe Allen down into the payload bay. Once in the payload bay, Gardner would approach the top of the spacecraft and cut off an omnidirectional antenna that would get in the way of the payload bay doors when it came time to come home. He would then attach another mechanism to the top of the spacecraft, known as the A-frame. With this second stable grapple fixture in place, Fisher could then move the RMS to the A-frame, leaving Allen and Gardner free to remove the stinger and place a berthing mechanism over the base of the satellite. After all that, Fisher would then use the RMS to lower the satellite into the berthing mechanism in the back of the payload bay, where it would be securely locked into place for the ride home. In short, use the stinger to grab the bottom of the satellite and move it into the payload bay. Attach the A-frame to the top of the satellite so that the robot arm can grab it there instead. Remove the stinger and attach a berthing mechanism and berth it. It was a pretty complicated operation. Despite the complexity, everything went perfectly according to plan, at least at first. Allen had no trouble attaching the stinger, and Fisher was able to get him and the satellite back to the payload bay. But then when it came time for Gardner to attach the A-frame over the top of the satellite, it wouldn't fit. Part of the satellite stuck out more than was expected based on engineering drawings, and the device simply would not attach to the satellite. Gee, this sure sounds familiar. Alright, it's time to get creative. With Fisher using the RMS to hold on to Palapa B-2, the EVA crew set up a foot restraint in the payload bay, and Allen locked himself in. He then grabbed the top of the satellite, holding it steady for Gardner while he attached the berthing mechanism. 
Allen was basically doing the job that the A-frame and RMS were supposed to do. Since the RMS had to disengage to allow Gardner to do his work, nothing was holding the nearly 10,000 pound satellite to the shuttle, but Joe Allen, literally just grabbing onto it by hand. He held it there for around an hour and a half as Gardner worked on the berthing mechanism, a task that wasn't even all that easy with two people and was considerably harder with just one. Gardner succeeded, and Palapa B-2 was finally lowered into the berthing mechanism, at last securely attached to Discovery. The crew floated back into the airlock after a highly unusual, but ultimately successful, six-hour EVA. Well, Hawk did say that getting even one of them would be a challenge. Flight Day 6 was another rest day to allow the crew to recover from the difficult EVA on Day 5 and prepare for the difficult EVA on Day 7. So while the crew takes a breather, let's look at another one of STS-51A's payloads, an experiment called Diffusive Mixing of Organic Solutions, or DEMOS. DEMOS was an experiment being flown by the company 3M, with the goal of... I'm actually not really sure. Growing crystals of some sort for reasons I'm not entirely clear on. But since they were grown in freefall, the crystals could grow a lot bigger and with higher purity than usual. Demos was made up of six small chemical reactors, each of which were split into three chambers. The two chambers on each side of the reactor were filled with chemicals and were then released into the center chamber where they would react. Demos sounds pretty neat, but it doesn't seem to have gone all that great. Half of the reactors failed to work properly due to a valve problem. Reading between the lines of the mission report, it sounds to me like they fried the motor that was supposed to open the valves but you can judge for yourself. It says, quote, The stepper motor that opens the valves between the chambers experienced a larger torque than the capability of the motor. Sure sounds like a fried motor to me. Nothing is easy on this flight. Now that we've safely destroyed Deimos, let's get back to ambitious spacewalks. On day 7, it was time to repeat the activities of day 5 but this time with the West Star 6 satellite. West Star 6 was the same design as Palapa B2, so the plan was to do the exact same thing. But since the original plan hadn't worked so great the first time, they decided to tweak it ahead of time. The retrieval would begin the same way, this time with Gardner taking the MMU out to retrieve the satellite. But rather than try fumbling with the A-frame, Allen would once again simply hold the spacecraft in place. To make orienting it a little easier, this time he slid his feet into the mobile foot restraint, perched on the end of the robot arm. Gardner once again single-handedly connected the berthing equipment, and West Star 6 was lowered down into the payload bay and securely locked into place. Both satellites had been retrieved. In celebration of the momentous achievement, Allen took a photo of Gardner in the payload bay, holding up a sign that stated, FOR SALE with the two spacecraft in the background. The insurance company, who would soon need to find a buyer for these communications satellites, was delighted. NASA management wasn't quite as thrilled, but the photo has become one of the most iconic of this era of spaceflight. After 5 hours and 43 minutes outside, Allen and Gardner climbed back into the airlock, sealed it up, and the spacewalk was over. It's worth noting that this flight was the last ever for the manned maneuvering unit, I've never seen a precise reason for the retirement of this remarkable device. It seems to be a combination of looking for ways to improve safety after the Challenger accident, and the fact that it doesn't really seem to be all that necessary. This is just my take, but the MMU seems like something that was made before everyone realized just how versatile and useful the robot arm was going to be, especially with an astronaut perched on the end of it using the mobile foot restraint. Add in the extensive maneuvering capabilities of the orbiter itself, and the case for the MMU just sort of vanishes. Or maybe drifts off into space. If you'd like to go see a real MMU, you can head to the Smithsonian's Udvar Hazy Center near Washington, D.C., and look above Space Shuttle Discovery to see the one used by Bruce McCandless in Hoot Gibson's famous photo. The MMU worn by Pinky Nelson during the troublesome Solar Max recovery is in the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. 
One other little item of interest from Flight Day 7, the crew noticed a small crater dug into window number 7, that is the starboard overhead window. The crater was less than a millimeter in diameter and did not impact the mission, but it was a reminder that space isn't always as big as you think it is. There's a fair amount of stuff flying around up there, both of natural origin, micrometeoroids, and artificial origin, little bits of rockets and satellites. In fact, with its gigantic exposed thermal protection system, the threat posed by orbital debris was one of the biggest safety concerns for the shuttle, being one of the greatest risks after ascent and entry. On the last day of the flight, all that was left to do was pack up and get ready to head home. The crew also took a few minutes to speak with President Reagan. One of these days I should try to build a list of all the instances of a sitting president speaking to a crew in space. But not today. 7 days, 23 hours, 44 minutes, and 56 seconds after lifting off, Discovery touched down for a second time, this time at the Kennedy Space Center. But the crew's job was not quite complete. As recounted in Hit's book, Bold They Rise, after getting off of the shuttle and returning to their quarters, they were approached by two employees of the U.S. Customs Department, who came bearing paperwork. It turns out that by importing something like $250 million worth of high-tech equipment into the U.S. in the form of two communication satellites, they were on the hook to pay the taxes. All $25 million worth of it. I guess the customs guys were just having a little bit of fun with the crew, because while they did actually have to sign some paperwork, NASA and the customs department had already worked out a waiver for the mission. I guess to make up for the shock of a bill for $25 million, the crew each received a U.S. Customs hat. So what did we get out of this flight? A couple more satisfied customers had commsats making their way up to geostationary orbit, so that's always nice. And Discovery continued to deliver excellent performance, a welcome addition to the fleet. NASA also demonstrated another capability that was unique to the space shuttle, the ability to retrieve and return a spacecraft. I was somewhat surprised to learn that this ability was only used a handful of times over the course of the program, so while it was certainly neat, it doesn't seem to have been the most critical capability. I wonder though, in a world where commercial satellites continued to exclusively launch on the shuttle, where the shuttle was able to meet its extreme schedule expectations, and where NASA maybe even got some more orbiters, maybe it would have been a more common occurrence. But that's just the idle dreaming of a space nerd. Next time, Discovery is on the launch pad again for its third flight. This flight is especially noteworthy since it's the Space Shuttle's first classified mission. Space Shuttle Discovery carried the first in the series of intelligence spacecraft, which were sent to a orbit. Wait, what? Am I not allowed to say Oh no, I don't know how they found me, but they found me. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass! <laughs>